Good morning. We are off to a good start. We started. Uh, Ken started seven minutes early and finished five minutes late. Uh, um, I won't take advantage of those uh, 12 minutes, so we want our coffee break. Um, quick uh, que answer to Victor's question. Uh, Brum and Grill have a nice paper on occasionally binding constraints, and that's uh, what we're using here. So uh, in the, this is a uh, brand new uh, work uh, by the four of us on margin regulation and volatility. So this will be very much an application of a computational method. I will say very little about computation. Um, and I uh, should say that uh, sort of before the project, the, the two on the left are the super capitalists believing in no regulation, whatever. And <laughs> Michael from uh, Deutsche Bundesbank and I are the regulators. Yeah? And after this paper, we are all confused. Uh, and I will tell you why. OK, so uh, currently, as most. Felix is a confirmed Marxist. Yeah, but. <laughs> Okay, so as most of you know much better than I do, currently there's an active policy debate on regulation in all kinds of financial markets in the aftermath of the most recent financial crisis. Uh, I could now cite out of a gazillion of white papers that are currently discussing all kinds of margin uh, regulations. One example is the Financial Stability Board. And they're always worried about excessive leverage. And somehow margin regulation can reduce this excessive leverage. Or we can, as policymakers, can have an effect on the leverage in the market. On the economic side, on the literature side, there's an old literature going back to John Genacopoulos, who has worked a lot on this, and, and others who sort of have shown in a theoretical fashion that borrowing against collateral indeed increases volatility. So now, of course, from a policy viewpoint, yeah, there's not only the, the if, but also the how big. So the question is, how big are the quantitative effects of uh, collateral and very little data out there. Why? Because we haven't regulated all that much. And so there isn't much data to really assess the quantitative impact on regulation. There's one notable exception in the United States, US Regulation T. In the aftermath of the 1929 uh, uh, crisis, um, the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 gave the Federal Reserve Board, uh, board the, the power to set initial margins on national exchanges. And this policy tool was actively used between 1947 and 1974. Here is the level. So they started out yeah, at 40, but then they were busy with the war. And uh, so then in 47, they started playing around. So the lowest level was here, the 40. But then once they started playing around with, they went all the way to 100%. That meant you couldn't take any loan against your stocks. Uh, and then they played around with it. And then in uh, 1974, they gave up. And it has been constant ever since. This is the initial level of margin. Yeah, if I start a new position, uh, yeah, I will just talk about this level. Now, uh, if you want to be precise, yeah, when you open a position, you deal with this level of which it has now been uh, at 50% since 1974. Uh, later, there are maintenance margins. So as yeah, your broker gives you uh, a little more leeway. But, this is sort of what's regulated the initial margin. And so now you have all these changes here. Yeah? So this is, of course, a delight. Let's see what's the effect. And people have looked at the effect. And what did they oh, did they come up with? Nothing. Yeah? So uh, uh, Fortune has, uh, has several papers, Kupiak, and they're very negative. And so Kupiak is the most negative one. And he says, yeah, there's. Uh, no substantial scientific evidence that the, uh, the changes in the market margin requirements really actively then have an impact on the volatility on the stock market. Uh, this is sort of a difficult statistical exercise. There's a huge discussion. Some people, yes, there is a little effect. Others say no, or maybe the effect even goes in the wrong direction. The upshot appears to be, yeah, and this is also then. Uh, uh, yeah, one of the reasons why in 1974 the Fed gave up on changing uh, the initial margin requirements because there isn't any action. And then the question is, why is that? Yeah, so, we, yeah, so many people, yeah, going back to the old literature, believe playing with the margin requirements gives me a power to have an impact on the leverage that people, how much leverage, uh, how much leverage investors have. 
and that should somehow affect then the uh, volatility, uh, uh, but then the, it's not in the data. So what's going on? So in our paper, we have a calibrated Lucas as a pricing model with margin uh, um, constraints, and uh, indeed we find that collateralized borrowing increases the return volatility on our long-lived assets. Um, so this is sort of this is just confirms uh, 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 the old literature. Then, however, we play with the margin requirements, just like in Regulation T. We move them around, and indeed, yeah, um, we have very little effect on volatility as long as there's an other long-lived asset that is unregulated. Yeah, in fact, we find sp strong spillover effects. We are regulating asset one, and there's way more action in asset two. Yeah, and finally, where yeah, we do a last exercise, we regulate everything, and then finally we have some strong effects. Yeah, so, in a nutshell, yeah, we are regulating here, yeah, people go somewhere else. Yeah, and so, this sort of has now changed my opinion on regulation. Yeah, if you can't regulate everything, it's not going to do much for us. That's sort of in a nutshell. This, now, after the crisis, yeah, question. Chris. But another conclusion you might reach is that if there are some kinds of uh, assets where volatility is very dangerous and damaging like that um, and others where volatility maybe doesn't matter very much like equity then you want to regulate the, the debt markets and leave the equity market to be the one that fluctuates um, Yes, but however, the question is, uh, is, is there such a thing as sort of non-dangerous volatility? Well, maybe, but maybe not, but, but I think there's some wisdom from the last decade and a half is that uh, the stock market bubble and bust in the late 90s and early 2000s didn't really have big macroeconomic consequences, but the credit bubble and bust had huge consequences. So that would suggest, I mean, your model might provide a... a, a, a rationale for why it's a lot more important to um, make sure that things don't go awry in the credit markets than in the stock market, which is sort of what Yeah, 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 so th that's n another direction, yeah, I, yeah, thanks. Uh, matters? Uh, <laughs> sizable effect, let's look at the numbers later, yeah? No, we're doing purely volatility, ah, yeah, we tried welfare. Uh, it's very, very difficult to get Pareto improving regulation. There's always some winners, some losers from a welfare perspective. Uh, we have what Ken calls a fishing expedition. We have fish and fish and fish. I haven't f called a single Pareto improving case. So we are focusing on volatility. According to Michael at Bundesbank, that's mostly what, what they have in mind. Yeah, uh, regular. Of course, I, I share your concern of welfare. Um, now, in particular, yeah, uh, yeah, since uh, yeah, Chris uh, mentioned the, the, the internet bubble, yeah, uh, that uh, sort of gave uh, this literature a little bit of the boost, but uh, lately it goes, you know, of course, after the recent financial crisis, a really big boost. Uh, there's now action in, uh, uh, in a growing literature everywhere, but in the I don't have time to uh, to really go into that. But so sort of both, what's the impact of collateralized borrowing on return volatility? Uh, what's the effect of uh, uh, margin requirements and changing them? That's sort of theoretical. Now uh, I am briefly going to outline an uh, infinite horizon economy, our model. Uh, that's very standard. Here, that's then where you can kill me, yeah, or will kill me, uh, when we specify our model and pick our parameter values. Um, and then uh, I want to give you some basic intuition, what's happening in this model, and then with this basic intuition, try to explain why regulating one asset doesn't give us that much action, and regulating the whole market gives us a lot of action. So. It's a standard infinite horizon exchange economy in discrete time. We have finitely many shocks. In this paper, we restrict ourselves to IID shocks as opposed to uh, general Markovian shocks. History of shocks is a, a, a date event. We have a single perishable consumption good. 
we have just two agents and uh, two assets. Our two agents have Epstein then utility and they have an individual endowment uh, that's uh, date event dependent. We have two long-lived assets, think of Lucas trees uh, with, with dividends. And so two labor endowments and two dividends gives us the entire aggregate endowment in our economy. Yeah? Labor endowment agent one plus labor endowment agent two plus dividend uh, of the long-lived asset one plus dividend of long-lived asset Lucas tree two. So that's the whole, uh, everything that comes in. Now, financial markets. You cannot uh, 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 short sell uh, the long-lived assets. So you have holdings theta of agent H uh, of asset A, non-negative. In addition to the long-lived assets, there are these short-lived bonds, those yeah, uh, yeah, you can uh, trade, buy or sell at a price uh, uh, P, uh, PJ. Now, you are allowed to short or borrow yeah, uh, in the bonds. However, if you do so, yeah, your short position must be collateralized. Now we pay off. We pay off the first tree with the first bond and the second tree with the second bond, meaning if you borrow by short selling the first bond, you have to hold a long position in the first uh, long-lived asset. If you borrow by short selling the second bond, that's paired to the second long-lived tree. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's here. So if, if you short sell a, a bond J, so that means yeah, uh, PJ times V is negative. Yeah, so this is a, you have a negative position, then you must have a long position in then the, the corresponding uh, long-lived asset. So uh, for then A equal to J. And uh, now we have a margin requirement, yeah, which imposes now a relationship between the equity you have and the amount uh, of the collateral. So let's look at this. This is actually the equity. So let's say now yeah, you uh, borrow an amount P times V. Yeah? So you borrow $500. So that's uh, negative. You hold $1,000 in General Electric stock. Yeah? That means then you have an equity of 500. You borrowed 500, makes a total of 1,000. Yeah? So that's the total position. And that has to be greater or equal some proportion of that 1,000. So margin T uh, regulation yeah, has these margin requirements. Yeah, this is a percentage of the value of the, the assets, the collateral. Yeah, uh, some people now call this a haircut and do M times the P times uh, fee is then what they call margin requirements. The literature is a mess. Since we are focusing on regulation T, we follow their language. Yeah, so we have margin. Uh, requirement times the value of your collateral. So this is a lower bound. So now let's think of an extreme case when MJ is one. Yeah, then you cannot borrow because that is collateral, smaller equal collateral plus that. So this means the fee has to be greater equal zero. So if this number is equal to one, you cannot borrow against the asset. If this is uh, zero, uh, then you can borrow as much as you hold uh, in, in your long uh, asset. By the way, uh, yeah, when I read the, the, the sort of the history of this uh, in 1929, uh, uh, brokers would give you uh, would, uh, uh, 90 to 95 percent uh, uh, you could borrow uh, if you in, in, in invested in stocks. Yeah? And then currently it's 50 percent. Uh, uh, okay, so um, now there's, uh, you could default without personal bankruptcy, without utility loss or penalty. Um, in a, in a companion uh, model, we do allow for actual default and, and a bond paying less than what's promised. In, in this particular uh, uh, paper, uh, we, uh, uh, we uh, prohibit uh, that. And uh, yeah, um, however, now when would default happen? When yeah, your phi is uh, uh, negative, yeah, so you borrowed in the bond a period, next period, you have to pay up that dollar that you promised. So that means yeah, you, ha you have to pay this amount. And if that's greater than the value of your collateral, which is the price of that uh, long-lived asset and what it pays in dividends, if, if your collateral position is less than what you are uh, promised, you walk away. You say goodbye. Yeah, here's my collateral. I'm not paying, uh, paying up. 
of. Now, what we do here, we set in this particular paper, we set the MJ large enough so that this actually uh, never happens. Um, and that's good enough for, the, for what we're trying to do here. Now, there are two types of margin requirements that we consider. First, market determined or endogenous requirements. Uh, this is, you can think of this as a stochastic version of the Kiyotaki Moore uh, model. Yeah, so what's important? I borrow today, and the most critical case tomorrow is, yeah, yeah, in, in, in my model, yeah, in, in the worst state, yeah, the, the lowest possible value of my collateral. So the, in, across all states tomorrow, I look at the minimal value of the price of the long-lived asset and the dividend. So times yeah, the number of shares you have, this is the lowest amount of collateral you may have. And what I want is that you cannot borrow more than that. So that means your collateral will always be more than sufficient or more than sufficient to pay off your debt. And that means you set the margin requirement according to this, to this expression. And this goes back to the ideas of Jenna Coppolos and, and Zane from 10, 12 years ago. In addition, we have a not further modeled regulating agency that can set a margin requirement. And uh, so it, it, yeah, we just arbitrarily, or not arbitrarily, exogenously set the MJ to some level. We always set it larger than the, the endogenous one so that we have no, uh, no default. So that's what we're looking uh, at. Yeah? So one is endogenously, they sort of set a level in equilibrium so that nobody has any incentive to default. The other one is as a, a regulator who says M is that value. That's the, uh, uh, the idea here. Now, now comes the, uh, the controversial part, uh, uh, or the most controversial part, you know, calibrating the model. Uh, we want a little action, uh, so we need some bad shocks. Uh, uh, so we looked at what uh, Barrow and his co-authors did in, in, in various uh, papers. And uh, so we allow here now for disaster shocks. We, I'm going to later present you results for an economy with six possible shocks. The shocks here are on the, on the, growth, rate, on the growth rate. So we have a growth uh, uh, economy, and the growth rate takes on six possible values. Five is the one that we are most, uh, in most of the time, normal growth. Um, six is sort of a boom state. Four is, little, uh, is, is like a recession, and then we have three disaster states. We calibrated both the rates and the probabilities so yeah, to match uh, the, uh, the moments in, in Barrow and Gin. And here, if you calculate uh, expected value and standard deviation, you get both of them at 2%. And yeah, we, we need occasionally, yeah, the people need to be hit over the head yeah, and, and have a bad shock so that we, we see something. We played around with this uh, a lot. Obviously, our quantitative results clearly depend on this. The uh, qualitative stone, uh, yeah, so we played with smaller shocks, so yeah, uh, yeah, this one is very extreme, so uh, yeah, um, played around, and the qualitative insights are surprisingly stable. Now, yes? The 0.56 means that there's a one-time you know, of the uh, endowment. Yes, so, so, no, so we lose 44%, 43.5%. Yes, yes. That's a good criticism, yeah. Uh, annual. We do every we, we, we. If it's gone, it's gone. The whole curve's gone. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, of course. Now you could argue after this, we should also then, yeah, we, we, then we need a Markovian setup. Yeah, so that after a really bad shock, you quickly uh, recover most of it. Um, okay, now, next, it, then now it gets more difficult. How big are our dividends and endowments? Um, so we looked at uh, NEPA, it's of collateralizable income, uh, stock dividends, uh, bond interest, rental income, and uh, found a number of about 11%, also looking at what Lustig and Chien did. We split this up into a level for stock dividends, which is about 4 to 5%, we shows 4%, and then a second asset, which is 7%. Of course, one can clearly argue about this. Later on, we will regulate the first asset, which we think of the stock market, and then have the unregulated asset of interest, 
regulation T doesn't apply to uh, uh, to bonds, yeah, um, and uh, so uh, and and rental income of seven percent. Now, with this 11% away, that leaves us with endowments of 89%. Yeah, so we have 11% uh, is, is uh, here income in the assets. 89% is uh, in, uh, labor endowment income. Uh, now, oh, one thing I should point out, everything is collinear. We want to abstract, abstract from idiosyncratic shocks. So we have an uh, aggregated, um, uh, we have here the, the social endowment. And so the dividends are yeah, uh, just the multiple of the social endowments. The same is true here for the uh, labor endowment. Or the individual endowments are also a fixed share of the uh, uh, aggregate endowment. Now, we create two agents. And we do this that we have one small agent and a large agent. The small agent gets 10% of the labor endowment. The large agent, 90%. Here's another number you now can uh, yell at me about. Where the heck is that 10% in coming from? We looked at the literature uh, and it says that about 20% of people in the United States hold stock. Poturba, this is Wissen Jorgens Atanasio. Poturba, however, says you can't look at them, all of them, because most of them have it sort of passively in a 401k. Take all of those out. Next question is we don't really want the percentage of people who own stock, but the percentage of their labor income. Yeah, honestly, I don't know what the right number is. We pick 10%. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, Romney does, yeah, has a huge amount of dividend income, but no labor income. But then again, yeah, many of you have a big labor income and, and dividend income. Yeah, this is, but the idea here is now, yeah, we have 10%, yeah, a small agent, now, and a large agent. This is, becomes important now when we go to the utility functions. Um, if I might make a yeah. suggestion on this, it seems to me that the way to calibrate that, I know the data would be hard to find, but it's um, you're interested in, in some sense what fraction of equity is held on the people who um, have a margin uh, borrowing account with a broker. Um, the people that don't have a margin account are kind of, maybe you need to model them separately, but they're obviously not going to be affected when the margin or margin or margin is changed. Head is setting up the account, the borrowing account with the broker is kind of a yeah, 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 yeah. I bet it's not very, I mean, it's certainly it's not much of the people who are when paid. Yeah. Um, Okay, utility parameters. Uh, both have identical IES of two. If you look at the literature, some people say it's less than one, some people say it's larger than one, we pick two. Uh, now, the small agent uh, uh, has low risk aversion. Those are our, yeah, will be our stockholders. They have a lower risk aversion of a half. The large agent who gets 90% of the uh, labor endowment as the, the non-stockholders, we set them to have a high risk aversion of 7. Why are we doing this? You know, in equilibrium, we want the small agent yeah, uh, yeah, with low, yeah, we entice them by the low risk aversion to hold the stock and the large agent to stay away so that we get this sort of 1090 split with respect to the stock holding. Victor, you had asked about uh, uh, time uh, horizon. We uh, calibrate the discount factor to match an annual risk-free rate of 1% for a regulated margin of 60%. So that's what we did, and then we keep this. We're not recalibrating every time we're changing the margin requirement. Now, uh, so uh, that, that's sort of the model. So to summarize, infinite horizon model, two agents, they can have trade in two long-lived assets and can borrow with bonds against these long-lived assets. We made these agents so that one of them, you know, that, uh, uh, she doesn't mind risk much. She's a small agent, but she doesn't mind risk much, so she will buy a lot of stock. The big agent who has a lot of labor income is very risk-averse and doesn't want to touch this necessarily. So 
we start in our first exercise. So the idea of the next three slides is to get a little bit of a feeling across and a little bit of intuition. Yeah, what the hell, yeah, this monster that we created here with this calibration, what's going on in there? So uh, the margin requirement on the first asset, our stock market is now one, meaning you cannot borrow against asset one, but you can borrow against asset two in, a, in an endogenous uh, fashion. If, if you do this yeah, uh, uh, over many long-run simulations, you find that the uh, uh, standard deviation of long-lived returns of the two assets combined is 7.4%. If you do something with natural borrowing limits, so no default, no margin regulation, sort of the standard model, you get 5.3%. Substantially more uh, volatility. Exactly what people sort of going back to gender couples in the 90s have told us. The excess return also goes up a lot. Um, in addition, we see big difference between the marginable and the non-marginable asset. So the non-marginable asset, where you can't borrow, has a much higher excess return and a high, much higher volatility of returns than the asset against which you can borrow. Here is sort of a, a, a snapshot from a simulation for 200 periods. It's way too much uh, information. Important here is, in normal times, after long normal times, important are first this, this graph and that graph. Agent 1 holding of the marginal and non-marginal asset. Agent 1 is a small risk, not risk loving, but very little risk averse small. Notice she all, most of the time holds both stocks. Then here we have so her holding of the bond. She's always leveraged. See, there's always here sort of, you know, some negative holding. So in normal times, this agent holds both stocks, but is leveraged by selling that bond and borrowing in the bond against the very risk averse second agent. That's a question. No, no idiosyncratic risk, yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh uh, so, a uh, very good point. So first, uh, uh, the two assets uh, uh, differ a little bit in size. One is 4% of aggregate endowment. The other one is 7% of aggregate endowment. Other than that, they are, yeah, so they are collinear with different marginal requirements. The one you cannot borrow against. The other one you can borrow against. To the price, I should point out these are, uh, because we're in a growth economy, these are the, uh, yeah, the growth is taken out. Yeah, so this is the, uh, if you want, detrended price uh, uh, bet between the two assets. Now here the price of the marginal asset is uh, considerably larger than the price of the non-marginal asset. The difference is not just 7 to 4. There's yeah, the size of the dividends. There's uh, the, here the uh, margin premium. Uh, that, that's also a collateral premium that's standard in the literature is present there. Now, what's happening? In normal times, the small, low risk averse agent holds the risky assets and is highly leveraged. Now a bad growth shock reduces her wealth and now she has to sell a portion of the risky assets. What do you do in this situation? <coughs> you always sell first the asset that's not marginable. Yeah, because you are, you are leveraged. Yeah, you need that, that asset too. You can borrow against that asset too. That has an extra value for you. You, you hold on to this as much as you can, and you first sell the other asset. So what that means, the other asset has higher trading volume and higher volatility. If you look back here, at the, uh, we here at, in period 50, the worst disaster uh, happens. And so then, here's the holding, yeah, the Asian must sell everything. It yeah, must sell the entire second asset and even a little bit of the first asset. Yeah, uh, and then here we have smaller shocks. Yeah, if you need money yeah, and you need to deleverage, you always sell first here the non-marginable uh, uh, asset. And uh, but who can who has to buy it? The large, high-risk averse agent then must buy the asset. But that guy is very risk averse, so the price has to drop. Otherwise, he won't touch that thing. Uh, and uh, so only the, the, he can buy the risky asset, and so the price must fall drastically. And so this is sort of 
there's lots of other things going on in this model, as your questions indicate, uh, yeah, or already or read. This is a basic mechanism. Yeah? And now, in light of this basic mechanism, we're now going to use our model to take a look at regulation T. How am I doing for time? Yeah, but I started six minutes later. Yeah. Uh, first, I'm assuming that the result would be quite different um, if uh, you had more assets than, the, as was mentioned, if you had like free assets and you had one insurance mechanism against uh, against the shock. And the third question is, your shocks are IID, am I right? So you come back to you come back to normal GDP as much as shocks. Yes. So that's why you know, you're expecting the price of the of your collateralized asset to go up in its period, uh, and that's why you're not going to sell it in a sense. Um, and you have to sell the other one to meet your margin. Um, uh, uh, would, 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 would these two changes change a lot the intuition of the model at, at this point, or? Uh, so, no, no, first, because of the big shock, uh, I'm uh, very poor yeah, if, 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 if we are H1. And, and so, so if, you, if you look here, it takes a long time for the price to go back up. Yeah, so the, the price here takes a hit and it takes quite a while for the uh, uh, for the price to go up to go yeah? so there's first a static effect but also a dynamic effect because I know that I will be poorer tomorrow yeah uh, and so that so if you as a risk averse guy you know that I'm poorer tomorrow still and can't buy yes we are back to normal GDP but I am not back to normal yeah I'm not back to normal um, okay so. Again, regulation T had a small effect on, on market volatility, uh, as I decided literature. Now we regulate the first agent, not to the level of 100% where you can't uh, do anything, but with a constant margin requirement, and we again have the second unregulated asset. And the idea here is stock market and the other stuff is bonds or houses. And now, how does return volatility change as, in respect to M1? Not much. So here, yeah, at first, we were very uh, disappointed. Yeah? Here on the uh, horizontal axis, we now have uh, the uh, margin requirement for the stock market. Here at 1, you are not allowed to borrow at all against the stock market. Here at 50, we are at, where, where we are at uh, uh, with regulation T and, and very close to the, uh, uh, to the uh, unregulated margin. And here now, here on the left, you may not be able to see it. Here we have 8%, 8.5%, a standard deviation of return. It first goes up a little bit, but then it drops. However, quantitatively, very little action. Why is that? When the margin requirement increases, two things happen. The regulated asset becomes less attractive as collateral. I can borrow less against it. And the overall ability of the agents to leverage decreases. These two effects now work against each other. Yeah, in response to a bad shock, what does our stockholder, the, the risk-loving agent, one do? She sells the regulated asset in equilibrium sooner because it's less valuable as collateral, as an equilibrium effect. However, she also has reduced ability to leverage. She can't leverage as much as that uh, second asset becomes less attractive. So as we go from left to right, the, 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 the stock... Uh, becomes less attractive uh, as a uh, collateral. And so yeah, we have these effects that work against each other, and so, yeah, first one is larger than the other, not much action. Now you may criticize this exercise and say there's a fundamental mistake. We have constant margins. The Fed yeah, reacted to when they perceived that maybe we were approaching uh, high leverage time, so what we really should do is do state-dependent regulation. Yeah, uh, here's a BIS in Basel, their Committee on Global Financial System. They like, their, this is sort of a key word in Europe right now, the macroprudential add-on. When things get really hot, you crank it up a little bit. And so, of course, we have no idea what the effect is. So, um, here, um, yeah, um, we now have in the four, in the bad states and the recession, we have... Uh, a level of 0.5, and this is here a typo. We have a higher margin of greater than 0.5 in the in, in the good states, and indeed we and the second asset remains unregulated. Can you? Thank you. And uh, here, yeah, we now see yeah, um, f first very little action, then it falls. So the the straight line is our regulated asset. But if you look 
here on the side, we go from about 8.35% down to 7.8%. Yeah, so this counter-cyclical regulation is helping a little bit, but not all that much. However, notice yeah, the, yeah, here the, uh, on, on the dash uh, here, uh, uh, line, this is the unregulated asset that has a big, much bigger decrease. Why? Because it, yeah, it becomes relatively much more attractive as collateral. So I really want to hold on to that in, yeah, and I'm even willing to forego some uh, consumption. And finally, last exercise, now let's regulate all markets. Let's regulate everything. Yeah, so even the so far uh, unregulated markets. And now here yeah, we get a lot of action. Now we're down here at 5 to 8%. So we have a very different scale. And now we see a, a significant drop. This is uniform and this is counter-cyclical regulation. Yeah? And so now we finally get a significant drop uh, uh, here. Yeah? And I'm out of time before I take your question, Victor. Uh, so uh, yeah, we looked at regulation T. Yeah? We uh, sort of can see yeah, or try to offer an explanation why regulation T didn't have big uh, yeah, or economically important effect in the uh, data. And it appears to be that yeah, uh, when there are other assets that are not regulated, those become more important and, and, and uh, uh, are used more heavily. And we only really have big effects of these margin regulation when all markets are regulated. That's sort of a little takeaway from our exercise. Victor, you had a question. So when do you regulate both markets? you regulate market by market or you put a market requirement on the total position? Sum across the two markets. Uh, here now we did a uh, sum of two markets together. Because you would presume that they would substitute it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we, yeah, we, you want to get rid of the, away from the substitution. We, you want to get away from the substitution. And uh, I, I've, I'm so forgetful I, in my old age. Some policymaker even had a hunch about this. And now I'm looking for that quote that I read two or three years ago. So I can put it in the slide. Yeah, someone had exactly that hunch, that substitution that you mentioned, and uh, yeah, and that as long as you have that substitution, you are in trouble. Sorry, I went over. One more question. I know I'm between you and the coffee uh, and the cookies. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention.